For our reading of the scriptures, we turn to Psalm 103. Psalm 103. And though we read it, most of it, a lot of it from the bap from the Lord's Supper form this morning, we read it again. Our sev- the seventeenth verse is the text that we have for tonight. Psalm one hundred three, a psalm of David. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. Who healeth all thy diseases. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction. Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west. So far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth, For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments to do them. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Bless ye the Lord, all ye his host, ye ministers of his that do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. May God bless our reading of his word. The 17th verse is the text that he gives us tonight. Psalm 103, verse 17. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him. And his righteousness unto children's children. When we have a little baby born, then often we see its whole life is before it. We'll say it that way sometimes. And so to read these verses just before the text, It's a little discouraging, and we wonder. He remembers we're dust. Our days are as grass. We flourish like the flower, but the wind passes over it and is gone. And then the striking statement, the place thereof shall know it no more.
We like to think we're important. At least to some. And yet, the reality that the place shall know it no more. You walk through any cemetery. And we know them no more. My children don't even know my grandfather. Never met him. I barely knew him because he died when I was yet eight. A few memories, a few stories, but the place knows him no more. And as generations go, we have to be struck by the reality so that as we prayed, This life is nothing but a continual death. And yet we bring a child into this kind of world. So that the Lord, by giving us this knowledge and making us think these things, he makes us realize that the key is the knowledge that we are the recipients of mercy. We receive mercy. We have to want to look at what that means and what that really is described. And it's interesting that in the baptism form, how many times the reference is to God's mercy. And then we sang of it in Psalm 136. And we sang of it in Psalm 89 when we began the service. It's God's mercy. And the text makes a contrast, this is interesting, between man whose days are like the dust and not God. You'd think it would be between man and God. But the contrast is between man whose dust and the mercy and the righteousness of God. There's the contrast. We're dust, but we receive a mercy that is from everlasting to everlasting. From eternity to eternity, from age to age. And he brings us, and we pray that when we're finished, this is where we're at. He brings us to think soberly, joyfully on this occasion, but also soberly. And sober thinking makes us realize that when we receive Jehovah's mercy, then all is well. There may be other things that make us scared and afraid. Knowledge of cancer. That easily makes us afraid, but it reminds us we're dust. But if we receive mercy, then all is well. Because to receive his mercy is to receive his righteousness, the gift of his righteousness. We consider then our text, Jehovah's everlasting mercy. We begin with considering what is given, what. Then we consider when, and then finally we consider to whom. Two words, two concepts make up the first point. One is mercy and the other is righteousness. We talk about mercy a lot. But do we understand what it is? Mercy is an attribute of God. And as an attribute of God, it means this about him. 
He is perfectly and absolutely blessed. Mercy. God is mercy. God now doesn't have mercy. God doesn't just give mercy. God is mercy. God is absolutely blessed. And he is always willing himself to be blessed. So think that first. Mercy means God is blessed. Absolutely. Fully blessed. And he always wills himself to be the blessed one. When that mercy is goes outside of God and he gives mercy, then he is revealing himself as such who is blessing some of his creatures. He seeks those creatures to be blessed. Now every creature that God is to whom God is going to give that mercy is of the dust. God created Adam out of the dust. God said to Adam after he fell, from the dust thou came, and unto dust shalt thou return. And we're worse than dust, really, because as those who are sinful in our whole being, then we are, if you will, dirty dust. But mercy is that attribute of God that is displayed outside of himself in willing to bless those in misery, those in a miserable condition, The scriptures speak of mercy sometimes as God having bowels of mercy. And that's a graphic description of the ardent nature of God's desire to bless. There is something deep within God where, as it were, he aches. Now, that's, that's an improper way to say it. But out of the depths of his being, he so desires to bless and make blessed those that are otherwise miserable. I'm constantly struck by the accuracy of Bartimaeus, the blind man at Jericho, a beggar, had nothing to give, blind, heard of the steps that were going by, heard a crowd passing by. Who is it? It's Jesus of Nazareth. Thou son of David, have mercy upon me. He had a cry for mercy because his condition was that he didn't deserve to receive anything from the son of David. But he acknowledged Jesus to be the son of David, the promised Messiah. And he begged him for mercy. He beseeched him for mercy. Deliver me from my miserable condition. I acknowledge it. When God gives mercy it's not just an attitude that commiserates or is compassionate it's not just a feeling with us in our condition but God's mercy has power like every one of others of God's attributes when they come out of him when he displays that blessedness that is his outside of himself it is effective it is powerful to deliver out of the misery. So to blind Bartimaeus, he gave his sight. Mercy, that blessed, ever-blessed God, effecting deliverance to us who are otherwise miserable, powerfully effecting regeneration, granting us forgiveness of sins, declaring us to be righteous. 
Mercy works the gift of righteousness. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. His righteousness unto children's children. Mercy then, that blessed one, absolutely perfectly blessed one, willing to bless some of his fallen creatures to deliver them out of their misery, effecting that deliverance and giving them righteousness. When God gives righteousness, just like when he gives mercy, he gives something of himself. So when we look at what righteousness is, we again have to go to God and see what does God say about himself as the righteous one. So it's an attribute of God according to which he is always in his being and in all of his works and everything that he does and says always is in perfect harmony with his holiness. To be righteous for God is that everything that he is and does is in perfect harmony with his own holy will, his holiness. We read the law of God tonight. We do it every Sunday morning because of the Lord's Supper this morning. We didn't read it this morning, but we read it now. Why? God's law is really the revelation of the holiness of his being. That's why when we violate one of God's commandments, we're touching his being, his person. Because he doesn't just artificially start making commandments of a various nature. Every one of his commandments arise out of who and what he is. He's holy. And as that holy God, he is in conformity with his own being, always. He's never sometimes holy and sometimes not. He never slips from perfect holiness. And now when that righteousness, that attribute comes out of God and he gives it to those who are the recipients of his mercy, it's a declaration, an official judgment by the perfect judge that that one to whom he gives mercy is also in perfect conformity with him. He looks at dust, dirty dust, or we may say a saint who never stops sinning, still a saint, and a saint because God makes that declaration and says, I declare you to be in harmony with me. Now, a judge may say that to somebody. You're innocent. You may go free. When God the judge declares someone to be righteous, innocent, not just innocent, free from guilt, but to be in perfect harmony with his own being, then he effects that. He makes that happen. He gives us that righteousness. So that's why the recipients of mercy receive the gift of righteousness. And that righteousness is that God not only sees us, but he, let's use the words of Lord's Day 23, he grants and imputes to us the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Jesus Christ. So that it's not only as if we never had had nor committed any sin, but it's as if God, it is as if we are, have done everything that Jesus accomplished for us. We're not only out of debt, we're immensely wealthy, righteous. The simple definition, to be right in God's sight. He makes us right. 
He doesn't just say it as a judge. He makes us so that you are righteous in God's sight. Sometimes they're like their mother, a little naughty. And their father. But to teach them that they're saints. But you got to know that about yourself and Amanda. God declares me to be right, to be holy, to be in conformity with Him. Nothing less, nothing short of the righteousness that's His. Then you can see why we're brought into His family. We belong to Him. We're His children. We're like Him. Second Peter, we're partakers of His holy nature. He bestows upon us that faith which enables us to know what he says about us in his word. We hold it for truth. If he says that's who we are, righteous, then we are a saint. Now the the beauty and the power of our text is not only the description of that mercy and his righteousness, it's his that he gives to us, but it says of that mercy that it's given, and it's probably not the most accurate or the best way to say it. When is it given? But it gets us into that understanding that it is from everlasting to everlasting. Now, God is most blessed forever. So God's, God is mercy eternally. But the psalmist isn't talking about the being of God. The psalmist, as he first speaks of mercies in verse 4, is describing that which God gives to these sinful creatures of the dust, whose life is nothing on earth but a continual death. They're here and they're gone, and then the place knows them no more. The place of earth may know them no more, but God knows them forever. And he's known us from eternity to eternity, but from eternity. In other words, he's never not known us. There's never a time in eternity past where God stopped and said, okay, I'm going to make a plan. That's the way we would do it. That's the way we first conceive of the way God did it. But God doesn't do that. His mind is in et- He is eternal. His mind is eternal. And in that eternal mind, He's always known unto Himself each one of those that fear Him. It comes to us in time, in the course of our earthly pilgrimage. It comes to us in time. But its origin is not in time. Its origin is in eternity from everlasting to everlasting. No beginning, no ending. Someone else put it this way. Time is a moment in God's eternity. The 6,000 years of earthly time since creation to now is but a moment in God's eternity. And God's mercy is eternal. It comes to us in time. Lamentations 3. Every morning 
we become conscious, we wake up, we start thinking, we guide our thinking, what does God think of me? And the answer is, you know what God thinks of you? He is blessing you. He declares you blessed. He judges you to be righteous. And we say his mercies are new every morning because we wake up and there it is again, unchangeably. And then we remember it's from everlasting to everlasting. This is what he's always thought. He's never not thought of us any other way. How, how can God's mercy on, an un, on, the, on us be eternal when we're creatures of time? And the answer to that can only be that in his eternal mind, his people are eternally with him. He eternally will to have a people to experience his blessedness, his willingness to bless them and to make them eternally rich and to be able to rejoice with him forever. He eternally determined to deliver us out of our deepest woe, out of our greatest misery, as a display of the wonder of mercy. He eternally determined to save unto himself a people to display the wonder, the amazing nature that he would look at dust, dirty, sinful dust, and say, I will to bless you. And you are blessed. I don't just want to, I make you blessed. That mercy of God is sovereign. He didn't think to show mercy after Adam fell. It wasn't something that came into existence in his mind after we fell, but it operated from eternity, and it will endure to all eternity. And to receive eternal mercy is to receive the gift of righteousness. We're going to say it again and again and again. To receive mercy is to be judged by that holy God to be in conformity to him. Now the, the amazing, what makes that wonder grow, it's not only a wonder that any one of us receive mercy, but the wonder is even more amazing because his righteousness is given to children's and to children's children. Now we understand that. We've talked about that many times before. But we ought never assume that our children and our children's children have to be saved, have to be the recipients of mercy, have to be judged by God to be righteous. When we wonder at the amazing nature of the gift of mercy to any one of us, then that that goes to children. And then to children's children, and to children's children, children. It implies that in time, God's spiritual people usually is in the line of generations. Though we always must add, not all, and not only, but the norm. 
is that God is graciously pleased to use the wonder that parents have of God to teach the children to be in wonder and amazement and awe of God. Then I become a little frightened when we can say God and not stop and wonder. When we can say child of God and it runs off our lips and through our heads and we're not even amazed anymore at what, we're just, what we just said. But when we stop now and we reflect That his righteousness makes me as blessed as he is in his sight. That he grants and imputes to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Jesus Christ. That he judges me to be holy, righteous. My conscience accuses me. But he, merely of grace, without any merit of my own, gives that gift. And then he communicates that graciously using rather feeble instruction, never perfect instruction, but he uses that to work mightily the reality of that truth into the hearts and minds of the children and children's children. So in every age, to all to whom God's word comes, here comes this verse. And he proclaims it. Not all, not only, not all of them. He doesn't have to. He makes us realize it's, a, it's mercy. It's not merited. It's not earned. It's not deserved. Not all. And then he goes outside and he takes someone other than us and he begins that success of generations again. Now when we put those three previous verses together with what we have here, but dust here, gone gone so that our earthly place knows it no more, but the mercy of Jehovah is from everlasting to everlasting. Consider what that means for us in our brief earthly pilgrimage. We prayed. Life is nothing but a continual death. There are miseries. Some of us have learned that loved ones have cancer. And it shakes us. Others of us are tired and troubled. But what this means in this life of misery is that God is shouting at us. He's speaking as only the Lord Jesus Christ himself can speak when he says to us that we are receiving eternal mercies. Jesus' birth in Bethlehem, and his death at Calvary comes out of Jehovah's mercy. God doesn't have mercy because of that. That's an evidence. That's a, a direct work of the mercy of Jehovah. Verse 11, as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. Again, to know the greatness of Jehovah's mercy. Measure the distance between the hellish agony that was his and the heavenly glory that he is, is his now. It means that every moment of our present earthly life under that ever faithful, merciful God. So how do we say it in Psalm 136? For his mercy endureth forever. 
No, you've got to say it again. For his mercy endureth forever. And we have to hear it 26 times. And that's not enough. Over and over and over, he pounds it into our minds and into our hearts. Tears. But then tears of joy. You are the recipient of the ever-blessed God willing to bless you and to effect that blessedness in you. He opens our eyes because that we can believe it is a fruit of that mercy. That we realize we're forgiven, completely forgiven of all of our sinfulness as well as all of our sin is a wonder of that mercy. And then he mercifully enters into the hearts of our children. We pray, we teach, but then we pray. We pray, pray, cover up my faults. Work, Lord, in spite of me. We bring them to Jesus to have him touch them. And he braces them. He takes them into his arms. He does more than what we ask or think. That means that we may know that his mercy never leaves us. He's always speaking good. God's mercy, our text says, is not common. It doesn't go to everybody. And this makes the wonder even more wonderful. It's particular. It's to them that fear him. Not to those who don't, but to them who fear him. Now, let's go back. That mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. That mercy is before our fear of him. And so we learn again that our fear is not the cause for God's mercy, but his mercy is what works in us the fear of him. It's because of his mercy that we believe in him. It's because of his mercy that we repent of our sin. It's because of his mercy that we turn to him. It's because of his mercy that we fear him. Now, we implied what that fear is. That fear is that which makes us meek because we see the wonder of the greatness of God. Not just his immense size, but the immense nature of every one of his attributes. His holiness. His love. His mercy. So the scriptures say he gives mercy. Mercy, 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 mercy. And you put all those mercies together and you have the word faithfulness. And then that's not enough. You have to say, great is thy faithfulness. Immense. But it's an awe. You can't conceive of God without bowing. He stands so brilliantly holy and bright and we're blinded as the shepherds. So every angel that appeared to a human made them fall down because of the brilliance of his glory that they conveyed in their persons. Wonder, how great is God? My God. And so again, as we read the law, how many times, I am Jehovah, thy God. I have established this relationship where I will be a God to you and to your seed after you. Are we always mindful 
Are we always in awe of Him? No, sometimes we're in awe of ourselves. Sometimes we don't even think about Him. Always think of ourselves, but not Him. And so He teaches us that it's in the way of our awe at those moments when we fear, and that's the right word, not be scared, but there's a trembling at the greatness of God, that that's when we truly appreciate what it is to receive his mercy. Listen to how it's put in Proverbs 3. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. Do that again. Let not mercy and truth forsake thy thoughts. Let them not forsake thee. Bind them as a necklace around your neck so they're always right there. Some of you ladies have rather bold necklaces. Let the mercy and truth of God be right there in front of you. And write them upon the table of thine heart so shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Proverbs 3, 3 and 4. Stay focused on the mercy of God. Then we find hope. Then we find encouragement. Then we walk humbly with our God. Amen. Bless thy word, Father. We mumble, we stutter, we begin to scratch the surface of the wonder of thy speech. Take it as only thou art able by thy spirit and work it mightily. Write it upon the tables of our hearts and of our minds. So we go forth conscious of how great thou art and then the wonder that we would be in thy family, the recipients of thy mercy and therefore of thy righteousness. Thanks, Jehovah, our God. Amen.